So a little bit about Basekit, which is my latest and greatest company. Uh, basically, uh, we are a website building platform that sits in the cloud. So what we're trying to do is enable small businesses to come online, create their own website that is great looking, functional, and social. Um, we're doing pretty well with it at the moment. Um, we've got several hundred thousand users all across the globe and lots of different distribution partners like hosting companies in lots of different territories. So um, hopefully I've kind of, uh, got a good background to talk to you about how to make the most of the cloud in your business. So for now, I want to kick off by asking that big question, what the hell is the cloud anyway? It's one of those terms that uh, has such a broad definition and it means different things to different people. But I think most people do have some sort of understanding of what it is these days. Uh, you know, the cloud, cloud computing, software as a service, all terms that starts to permeate into everybody's life and everybody's business. So yeah, I think most people uh, have some idea of what the cloud is, so I just want to look around a bit about uh, what people have been saying about it and where it came from in the first place. Uh, mainstream, in about 2006, when Google started talking about uh, this new thing, the cloud, and cloud computing, uh, basically Google's Eric Schmidt and the whole Google company really has started to notice how people were starting to use uh, the internet to get services, so to get their software, to get their data, and uh, to get their computing power as well. So it was this new thing that was coming about, uh, really that was about the behavior of how people were consuming. Um, and I think Google were really the first company that started to realize how big this might be. So the next few years, some of the other big players jumped on board, the IBMs, the Microsofts, the Amazons, the Oracles, so all the big major players jumped on board. So I think uh, one of the things that really kind of booted it into the mainstream was when Amazon, uh, who were kind of one of the first cloud providers really, uh, took on the name cloud for their computing service. And that really became kind of mainstream uh, tech uh, phrase that was just bandied about everywhere. So the term has become a ubiquitous piece of jargon with all these big guys, uh, but actually some of these guys uh, and the executives of these companies haven't actually liked the term at times. So let's have a look at some of the bad things people have said about it. So famously, Oracle CEO Larry Ellison said about the cloud, it's complete gibberish. Uh, when is this EBC going to stop? And it's insane. So you can see that it's kind of a confused term. Uh, but interestingly, within a couple of years of him making that statement, Oracle released a massive slew of products with the cloud name on it. Uh, another example of that is Tom Siebel of Siebel Systems. Uh, was talking about a, a then new cloud CRM company, and he said, this company's not going to be around next year. That company happened to be salesforce.com, which is now worth tens of billions of dollars. So obviously, there's a lot of negativity here. People say it's insecure and unreliable. But I think it's really shown that actually, uh, computer systems are only as reliable as how you implement things upon them. So actually, the cloud uh, is not a factor in their reliability or their security, really. So let's push all the bad out of the way and move on to some of the good things that people have said. So every superlative under the sun has been used uh, to describe the cloud and how it's going to change our lives. So people say it's transformative, <coughs> game-changing and empowering, uh, and the biggest paradigm shift in computing history. Uh, all these things are said about the cloud. Uh, but you know, really, we still haven't got to the crux of it, uh, and that is, what the hell is it? So firstly, uh, just a light-hearted kind of diversion. Because of all this buzz and this hype around the cloud, uh, this other term came out into the mainstream, which is called cloud washing. And that was basically because there were some companies out there who were scared about the term the cloud, but they didn't know how to get on board. So they thought, what the hell, we'll just call our product the cloud anyway, because it sits on the internet. So I think the Stillbook cartoon sums it up perfectly. Uh, I love the way at the end he says, we only need to confront stuff. Dumb customers, dumb people believe anything. <coughs> so I think really the confusion around the cloud comes about because it really blurs the line between uh, what the internet is, which has been around for many, many years, and then this new term, the cloud, which is really just a new way of using the internet, a new way of packaging services. So people are very confused about what it actually means. So I want to throw a couple of questions out to the room. Uh, to get you guys involved and to find out a bit about 
uh, whether you think you know about the cloud. So firstly, can I just have a show of hands if you think you kind of understand what the cloud is all about? Okay, so probably about half the room, maybe a little more. Um, so do people use cloud software as a service products in their business? Raise your hand if you do, things like Google Apps. Yeah, probably about 50% as well. Uh, are there <coughs> software providers out there? Any cloud services, software as a service vendors? One at the back, one potential here. Um, okay, so it's encouraging to see that uh, you know you guys are starting to get on board with the cloud and it is really starting to permeate into to businesses of all sizes. So, uh, let's move on to my definition of what the cloud is and hopefully I can try and demystify it a little bit. So cloud computing is the use of computing resources, whether that's hardware, either servers, or software, that, that are delivered, importantly, as a service via the internet with the following characteristics. So I'll explain, explain these in more detail in a second, but I think a cloud service needs to be self-service, multi-tenant, elastic, and scalable, and accessible for multiple devices. So let's have a look at what these terms mean. So self-service really talks about uh, you know, the cloud model of delivering services and delivering software. Uh, long gone are the days where you receive something through the post and you know, <coughs> a package that you have to wait days for. Uh, you don't need to talk to a sales team, you don't need to pick up the phone. You can literally go to a website, sign up, and get the service or the software you need absolutely on demand instantly. Uh, and I think that's a really important aspect of, of what the cloud can bring. <coughs> Multi-tenancy, uh, it's a bit of a techie term, but what that basically means is you're sharing software with other users and other organizations. Uh, you know, a, an email server or a Microsoft Office or whatever it might be, you can install that version for yourself. But with the cloud, you're sharing that software with everybody. Uh, so that's kind of the technical side of it, but we'll come back later to show what the advantages are of that. So when you're sharing software in the cloud with other people, there are, there are great advantages for communication, collaboration and other things like that that can help your business. So these two, elasticity and scalability, are about really adjusting uh, what the service does in according to demand. <coughs> so usually you have to think a lot about <coughs> how many servers you need, how much power you need to run an application, but these days you don't need to worry about that. So if you're driving a software as a service uh, solution for your business and there are three of you using it this week, and then you roll it out to your workforce of 3,000 people next week, you don't have to worry about whether that's going to work or not. It, it just elastically scales up to, to meet that demand. And finally, the accessibility for multiple devices. So the cloud is all about, uh, by definition, being online, being on the internet. So uh, you know, if, if your data is already on the internet, it makes sense that it should be used for multiple devices. And it also means that uh, the applications that you use get different contexts uh, and give you more mobility. Okay, so that's uh, kind of my definition of the cloud, which I know has been a massive mouthful. It's a bit of a big definition, but I think the cloud deserves that. I think it's a term that is too often slapped on things uh, without much understanding. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of a background of, of what, what it's all about. So let's move on to what this means in, in practice. What, what sort of services can you guys get as a business? So this is basically uh, the three main broad types of service that we're looking at with cloud. <coughs> so starting at the top, software as a service, probably uh, all, the, all of you in the room will have heard of that or use it to some degree. Uh, and that is really end, uh, aimed at end users. <coughs> and in the middle, sandwiched between the two, we've got what's called platform as a service which is basically about providing some of the cloud infrastructure from the bottom layer and allowing uh, people to quickly and quickly <coughs> create applications uh, or software as a service for other users in a bespoke way. And then finally, the foundation of everything is infrastructure as a service at the bottom, uh, and that is about the servers and the computing power uh, and really enabling businesses to, to build their own networks, to build their own infrastructure very, very cheaply. So all of these cloud kind of service types share one big selling point, and that is you, as a business, are massively reducing the costs associated with maintaining and installing and configuring the hardware or the software that is involved in these services that you consume. 
So let's have a look at some chat examples. So probably 50% of you put your hand up when I asked about uh, whether you used SaaS products in your business. Probably one of the common ones would be Google Apps. Uh, <coughs> Google provide basically everything you need to run your business. So you've got an email application, which you can run in a web browser, and runs on your mobile phone and other devices. Uh, so got calendaring, contacts, document editing. So really, for basically for free, if you've got a small business, you can get everything that you need instantly to run your business. Now, if I look sort of five or ten years ago, uh, when I started my first few businesses, um, you know, the first things you do is you buy a server. You'd spend a couple of thousand pounds, you'd get, uh, you know, a mail server to run your email, and then you'd buy Microsoft Office for all your employees, and it was just a massive expense and, you know, a real headache as well to, to make sure all that was installed and configured and set up correctly. And it was prone to go wrong quite often as well. With things like Google Apps and some of these other services, you don't need to worry about any of that. You can just literally try these things out. They cost either nothing, in the case of Google Apps, or when you scale up your business a little bit more, you might be paying 50 or 100 bucks per user per year. Uh, it really is not a lot of money. So I won't spend a ton of time going through some of these, but uh, these are really the, the kind of business-based SaaS examples that stick out for me. Uh, Salesforce.com is a massive CRM provider, uh, and these, as a company, were really one of the forerunners of the whole software as a service movement. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, we've already had that mentioned in a couple of talks today, uh, but that's about really business networking, talking to other businesses and making connections, and these do have a premium version that give you more and more features. And even the Microsofts of the world, so Microsoft Office used to be the DVD or the CD you used to get and stick into your computer, you know, even these guys are getting on board now, so you can use your Microsoft products online. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, why software as a service is good, because it's all very well seeing all these examples, but why should you as a business use them? What advantages do you have? So one big thing that software as a service or on-demand software gives you is basically an accelerated feature delivery. <coughs> now, this all comes about really because the software that you're running is online. Um, you don't need to install anything. You don't need somebody to come out and configure anything. So when the software company behind it decides to make an update for whatever reason, you just get that update for free, and you get it within your browser next time you log in and use the service. Another neat thing about this is that because it's an online application, basically the SaaS provider can be tracking your behavior. So if you're bumping into things that you're really not understanding <coughs> and there are features that you just can't complete, they're going to have the statistics and the intelligence on what's going on there. So then next time they're in their development cycle or development meeting, they can be talking about that feature and making sure that it gets fixed you know, in a really timely manner. So most SaaS applications would probably be updated relatively frequently. So back to the days of putting a CD into your computer, you might get an update to that software once a year, or once every couple of years even. Um, but with SaaS, you would probably get an update maybe monthly, maybe weekly. There are even some companies that go down right to daily or hourly, and they're constantly releasing bug fixes and updates to, to everything they do. So another big one that I hinted at earlier is just to do with the fact that you're online. And online by nature means that you're hyper-connected to other people. So that means there's a massive uh, possibility for communication and collaboration. Just an amazing example of this is if you look at Google Apps uh, and the Google document editing. Uh, you can literally be sitting inside a word processor document uh, with three other people, you can see their cursors, you can see exactly what they're doing, and you are real-time collaborating on a document. Those people could be on opposite sides of the world. It just works and works really well. And I think that's an example of where if you took <coughs> Microsoft Word, uh, the old offline version, and you compared it with Google Documents, and you looked at the feature to feature, I'm sure that Microsoft Office would absolutely kick it out of the field with the number of features it has. But actually, when you give Google Docs a try, and you see the collaboration and the communication features that it has, as a business, you know, those become the killer features. Yes, you can edit your document, you can do all those things, 
but really the killer feature you've got there is the fact that you as a business can work more efficiently and more effectively. And obviously for a business, it is inherently collaborative and you do need to have strong communication. So these two things just need to be top of your list. So moving down the service type pyramid that I showed you earlier, uh, we've now got platform as a service. So this is really kind of going one level deeper into what the cloud is. So with platform as a service, a provider will give you the platform on which to build applications. So if you're a business and you need some bespoke uh, functionality uh, within your business for your workforce to use, for example, or even for your users to consume, then you can use one of these providers uh, to really accelerate the development process. So what you're getting with a pass is you're getting the infrastructure, but you're getting that packaged in a really neat and non-complex way, uh, and you're getting development libraries, so that as an application developer, you can very quickly and easily build an application, deploy it to the cloud, and have all the benefits that come with that. So some examples of that. Uh, we've got Google App Engine, Windows Azure, and IBM Cloud are all your classic examples of platform as a service. So they provide you with a development stack and let you build uh, things on top of the cloud. Uh, and salesforce.com, or force.com in this example, is a really unique example because what these guys do is they give you a means to build an application but on top of the Salesforce CRM platform. So if you're a sales-based business um, and Salesforce just doesn't do quite what you need it to do, you know, this is really empowering you to quite easily extend that functionality to, to make it more useful to your business. Okay, right down to the bottom of the pyramid now. This is really the foundational layer, um, and really everything else is built on top of this. So the platforms as a service are built on top of the infrastructure, and the software as a service will be built on top of this layer. <coughs> so Amazon Web Services, hopefully you guys have all heard of that. If not, by the end of this talk, you probably will know it inside out. Uh, but these guys are really the dominant force in cloud <coughs> infrastructure. There are lots of other providers, but I think these guys are really the forerunners uh, and have got a really mature product now. So basically what they provide you with a virtual service. So you don't need to go uh, to a shop or you don't need to order online and get a physical computer. You can literally, on demand, within seconds or minutes, have computing power available for you to use. Uh, you know, and that is a massively powerful concept and a big shift in the way that computing can be consumed. So the other players in this space, Windows Azure has popped up again because they're kind of in the platform and infrastructure spaces. Google Compute Engine is one that's only about four or five months old, and uh, Rackspace Cloud. They all offer kind of similar features to Amazon, but I think uh, for me, I'm probably going to sound like an Amazon salesman now, but Amazon is more mature uh, and is really great for, for a startup business. So we've had a look at um, some of the kind of stack of services that you can get with the cloud, and also some of the characteristics of what a cloud service is. Um, but I think one of the benefits of the cloud that you probably have all heard is that it's cheaper. Um, it's more economical. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into how it's cheaper and, and what are the kind of benefits that you can use with cloud infrastructure. Uh, well, I think the caveat is, I guess, that it's not for every, it's not for every business. I mean, if you... I think if you're a bigger player uh, and you have a lot of cash, then actually it might be cheaper for you to go and buy some servers and buy some infrastructure, uh, you know, in some cases. <coughs> but actually, I'm going to go into some of the economics of, of things now, so hopefully that might answer the question a bit more. So I'm going to give you the Cloud Economics 101. Um, and really, you've got to start by turning things on its head. So really, on-demand services like cloud infrastructure cost less, even though they actually cost more, which sounds like total nonsense, but what I mean by that is that one hour of computing time in a cloud infrastructure provider will cost more than if you own that hardware. So that still might make no, no sense to you, because you're probably asking, then, how the hell is the cloud cheaper? Well, it all comes down to utilization, and that's why we've got this taxi on this slide. If you think about 
riding in a taxi every day to work and back and to the shops and all, uh, at the weekend as well, and you add up the total cost of that, you're obviously going to be better off buying a car because that's going to cost you hundreds or thousands of pounds every month. But actually, if you're only making a couple of journeys a week, that might only be 20, 30 quid a week that you need to spend. So actually, in that situation, you'd be better off just taking the taxi. So it's basically like a light switch, like your electricity at home. When you turn the switch on, your meter is ticking over, and you're paying for that service. But as soon as you turn the light off, the meter stops, and basically you pay zero for that. So I guess to answer the question that you said, you know, it's about the utilization. If you can optimize your utilization, then you're better off to own the hardware. But as we'll see in the demonstration now, in most cases, you just can't predict that, and you can't control that. So, imagine that you are launching your new software as a service product uh, and you want this to go as big as it can be and take on millions of users uh, and make you millions of pounds. So, it could look something like this. Imagine the time along the bottom is around about a year and then the grey curve that you see there is an example of how a company might grow. So, what this is trying to depict is that the company is growing kind of slowly at the beginning uh, and then at the end, coming to a kind of plateau, but then you've got a big spike of demand that comes back down. So I'm just trying to show several different scenarios and how cloud infrastructure compares to normal on-premise infrastructure. So imagine where 10 years ago, cloud doesn't really exist. So what you've got to do is you've got to make some decisions up front. You're launching this software service. You've got to decide how much computing power do I need? How many servers do I need to buy? So you make a decision. Obviously, you don't have the benefit of this graph, so you can't see ahead six months. So you buy a block of computers that gives you that capacity. So you're going to hit a situation like this at some point where, actually, your capacity is not big enough to hit the demand. And that's great, because your business is growing, uh, and you, you kind of want that situation to happen. But how do we deal with that? And obviously, this red area, let's just explain, is all about uh, really a period where there's going to be degradation to your service. So your users are either going to have a really poor performance, really sluggish and really slow, or they're just not going to be able to access it at all. It's going to be downtime. Uh, and if your customers are paying you, or whether they're not paying you, uh, that's going to lead to one thing, which is off customers. So what do you do? You buy some more servers. <coughs> so let's imagine that you've doubled the number of servers. But we're pre-cloud at the moment, which means Nothing's on demand. Things take time. So you end up with a situation like this, where on the left-hand side, it's taken you maybe three, four weeks to get those computer, uh, to get those servers online. Uh, so the left-hand side is really just a delay. And the right-hand side, spike of red, is where you just simply can't react in time because you need to purchase things. You need to wait for them to be delivered. Uh, you know, and that's just not a model that, that uh, responds well when you've got quite a volatile usage curve. So, again, uh, you're going to have some annoyed users here. But there's also something else that uh, is probably less obvious until I do this. What you've got here is a massive amount of wasted resource. So you've already paid for all this. So actually, this is money that's just going down the toilet. So if you look on the left-hand side, there's probably less than 50% of that power, you know, those computers being used. So actually, if you're you know, a startup business or a business of any size, that's, that's money that you're literally throwing away. So let's compare this with the new cloud infrastructure model. Um, and you get something like this. So with cloud, you can turn servers on and off on demand, a bit like the light switch analogy. So you turn one on to begin with as your service grows. And then as and when you need more demand, you just turn the cloud servers on. And importantly, if you look on the right-hand side, where the curve comes down again, you can also switch those off again, which you can't do when you're buying things. You can't really send them back. So what you're ending up here with is something that is far cheaper, far more economical than buying your own hardware. And you know, because this is the infrastructure as a service, this is the cloud infrastructure that powers everything else, this is how you're getting benefits in your software as a service as well. This is how they can be so cheap and how they can scale to meet the demands of, of any number of users that come along.
So I guess the really powerful concept here is that you don't need your crystal ball. You don't need to look into the future at all because with cloud, everything happens kind of automatically. So with a service like Amazon, you can tell it that when your demand goes above your capacity, <coughs> just give me a new server and that server will come online within a couple of minutes. So you'll never, ever be in a situation where you're annoying your customers because they can't access the service. You know, that is a, a massive shift in how you can do things. So hopefully that's given you the kind of economics 101 of, of the cloud. And to your question, I think that's maybe answered it. So if you had a lot more usage out of that, it would obviously be worth you buying it. But uh, in that example, there's a lot of money being wasted. There is still some yellow there, but if you kind of work that out, I think it would be a lot less. I didn't actually highlight the yellow. Maybe I should have done. I was a bit biased. Okay, so that's the kind of economics 101. Um, it shows you the cost and time savings, really, because these things are firing up and down easily. You don't need system administrators, and you don't need staff to deal with anything. So remember, even though this is really talking about money, there's massive time savings involved here, too. So now I want to tell you a little bit more about how my company, Basekit, uses cloud infrastructure uh, and how it's really enabled us uh, from pretty humble beginnings over in Chepstow, where we had three guys in a little office, you know, enabled us to be truly a global uh, technology product. And I think before the days of the cloud, that just simply wouldn't have been possible. So as I said, I'm in Amazon sales mode again. Um, they're not paying me honest. But we use extensively Amazon Web Services, and we just find it absolutely fantastic as a cloud provider. Um, what they give you is the ability, like we've seen, to turn on and off servers. But they also have a slew of other services around it that help you to basically take your application to be more global uh, and to be more functional and powerful for your users. The first story I love about Amazon Web Services, um, and I'm not 100% sure if it's true, but I'll tell you anyway, uh, was that the reason Amazon started the Amazon Web Services business was because they had the problem that I've just highlighted there. They had this massive spike of demand at Christmas where they needed something like 10, 20 times the amount of servers that they would during the rest of the year just to meet that Christmas demand. And if you take a com uh, company like Amazon that are a worldwide company, you're probably talking about tens or hundreds of millions of pounds in expense for them to, to just hit that Christmas uh, period. Um, so I guess the management put their heads together and said, what can we do about this? How can we make some money out of this hardware? And this was in the, probably the pre-cloud days uh, before there were any such infrastructure providers. But one of their engineers put forward a proposal and said, you know what? Why don't we just rent tap this capacity? Why don't we just you know, sell it? Um, and so they did. And I think they probably didn't realize how successful it was going to be. And they don't actually release figures for this business on its own but it's rumored to be worth to them somewhere around $6 billion a year just for their web services business. So, you know, it really has gone to be a huge part of what they do. So, some of the features that we can use, uh, and I'm going to go a bit technical on you, but please bear with me because what I want to build up here is a picture of um, really the kind of opportunity that the cloud has given us. So, although I'm going to describe some technical concepts here, um, the conclusion will show you, you know, what we've managed to build by taking on board some of these strategies. So some of the things we do is load balancing, uh, content delivery globally. Uh, we do auto scaling, which we've touched on already, uh, and storage. <coughs> so let me just quickly run you through some of these concepts. So we have a bunch of servers that are in Amazon, and we have a bunch of users on the left that are trying to use our service. So we use this facility called a load balancer in the middle, which basically will automatically distribute uh, traffic up and down between our servers. And you might think, you know, why do you do that? Um, I mean, there's a couple of different reasons. Number one, because the performance is going to be better, because you're always routing requests to a server which has got some capacity to deal with it. But number two is you're building some principles of high availability. <laughs> so if one of those servers happens to die, then you've got more to deal with the load. So what will happen here is the load balancer will figure out, hey, this server's died, what do we do? And instead of routing traffic to it, it will instead go to the other three. Now imagine that situation didn't happen. Basically, every four clicks of the mouse, your users would get an error, would, something would go wrong. So your service would basically fall to its knees. 
We can take this one step further, where Amazon let you basically distribute your servers out across bigger uh, locations. So they've got what they call availability zones. So an availability zone would be in the same general geographic location, but in a separate building, usually. Um, they don't really release a lot of details about this, but it's basically isolated to a disaster that would happen on a small scale to that data center. So let's say there was a fire <coughs> in one of their data centers, which can and probably does happen sometimes. Um, what would happen here is the load balancer would figure out something had gone wrong, and it would just serve from the other availability zone, which means our customers stay happy, even though Amazon are probably having a pretty bad day. So we can take this one step further yet again, and we can say, right, this works on a global level as well. So Amazon allow you to choose exactly where you want your service to be. So we choose some to be in the EU, we choose some to be in the US, some to be in Singapore and Australia and all these different places. And that basically gives us a couple of advantages. <coughs> Number one, it means that the users that are nearest to those servers are going to have a better performance because the latency that you get when you have long distance internet traffic can be a problem and can make things take a couple of seconds more to respond. So actually by distributing your servers out like this around the world, your users are going to have a better experience. But number two, we also have this extra level of redundancy yet again, where even if a disaster happens you know, on a natural disaster scale, you know, if there's a tsunami, if there's an earthquake, um, you know, and these things do happen. The, the Japan tsunami took down tons of data centers. The New York storms the other week took down tons of data centers too, and lots of services were affected. So what this is giving us is redundancy at, at that global level. So our customers are always going to remain happy uh, and able to access what we do. So again, I've gone into kind of quite a bit of technical detail, but what I wanted to give you a picture of was what cloud infrastructure has really meant to our business and what it's given us. So to summarize what we've got, we've got a global network of servers that are serving our application. Uh, we've got high availability um, for all of our users across the world at all times. We're massively fault and even natural disaster tolerant. Uh, we can scale up and down to meet demands. So if we suddenly have a great bit of press and we have tons of visits, you know, we can deal with that. Uh, at the moment, we have capacity for hundreds of thousands of users. And we pay a couple of thousand a month for that privilege. And really, if you think about what we've got here, that would have cost tens or hundreds of millions of pounds to deploy an infrastructure like that on a global level. But with the cloud, we pay a couple of thousand bucks a month, and we get to take advantage of all these great things. And remember also that we're talking about the cloud. So this is all on demand. This is all self-service. I've never gone to the Amazon office or picked up the phone and spoken to anyone. All I've done is visited their website, filled in a form, clicked a button, and I've managed to set up all this. So it's pretty spectacular, really, what the cloud can bring to your business. So just to summarize uh, and kind of wrap up, I want to give you some of the advantages, I think, of, of the cloud as a whole. Um, now, your businesses might not use the cloud as much as I've described here, but I think some of the same principles apply even down to software as a service level uh, and some of, the, some of the more kind of consumer-based things that you can do with the cloud. So, actually, I've missed a slide. So, yeah, everything we've built absolutely wouldn't be possible pre-cloud. It would have cost tens or hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, you know, we were three guys sitting in an office in Chepstow, like I said, a couple of years ago. Uh, but we could truly do business globally. You know, we could have users all around the world taking advantage. And I think a really key point is that we can genuinely compete with some of the big tech players out there. You know, we're more agile. Uh, we, we kind of know exactly what we're doing rather than have the big companies that they have to deal with so we can be more nimble. Um, and with this cloud infrastructure, we've got a technology level playing field, if you like. So again, I'm going to go over a few advantages of the cloud just to wrap the talk up and then hopefully we'll get into a bit of discussion about some of these points. I don't know how quick I've been. Or <laughs> so the big one, obviously, for your business is no big upfront costs. So gone are the days where you need to spend hundreds of pounds on Microsoft Office or on a new mail server or whatever it might be. You just, you just don't have to do that anymore. 
Most things will let you get started even for free. Uh, you know, you might have a 30-day free trial, or you might have a couple of users for free. So it's not just lowering the barriers of entry. They've absolutely eliminated the barriers of entry. Um, and I definitely urge you all to, to try some of these things out. You know, dive in and try some software as a service that might be useful to your business, because <coughs> you might be surprised that it is a lot better than you might have realized. So another key benefit, I think, when you wrap all these things together, uh, all these benefits, uh, basically, you don't need to install anything. You don't need to configure anything. Uh, you don't need staff to do these things. So you can take all those resources that you would have put into doing all those things pre-cloud, and instead you can put them into doing uh, things that are going to get you to market a lot quicker. And I think the cloud is really driving innovation in that way. Um, you know, cloud infrastructure will let you prototype things really quickly, so you don't need to be afraid of trying things. Um, you can really innovate and iterate uh, and get your products out there a lot quicker than you ever could. And because we're in the cloud, we're on the internet, we're hyper-connected. So that means the communication and the collaboration, if you're using software as a service, that means access from multiple different mobile devices, mobile phones, laptops, tablets. So it mobilizes your workforce. You know, people are no longer tied to the office. You could roll out a software as a service package to a company of 1,000 people in, in half an hour, you know, all across the world or across the UK. You don't need to send things around. There's no bits to play with. It's just it's instant and on <coughs> demand. And finally, I think this one is the biggest point for me. You just get to focus on what you do best. You, your business has a value, has a problem that it's trying to solve. You're not trying to solve how to do servers and how to install software. That's not part of what you guys do and part of why you're here. So with the cloud, all that stuff moves out of your way so you can focus on what it is you do best. Well, I think we've always tried to kind of engineer things so that if we needed to hop to a different provider, then we could. So we are definitely flexible in that sense. So I think you've got to, yeah, you have to engineer and you have to think through how you're going to do things with the cloud because you don't want to get caught out. Um, you know, the same with Amazon as, as with some software as a service packages might look free, but then as soon as you go over a certain number of users, you're paying hundreds of dollars a month. Uh, you know, so there are some expensive ones out there and it's, it's kind of a similar deal. So you've got to, just got to be careful, I think, um, and always have a plan B. You, they have a feature called reserved instances. So it's kind, of, it's kind of back to the old model of computing where you can say, actually, uh, you know, I know I need to scale up and down my computers to some level, but actually I think I'm always going to need this number, so I'm going to reserve these instances for a number of years, and then I pay quite a lot less. So you can do that, um, but then you need to commit to it, and then you have the same kind of lack of benefits that you had before the cloud. Well, I think... I mean, with Amazon, for starters, they've got data centers all around the world. And I mean, we've, uh, we've dealt with certain people in, in certain businesses where, you know, they'll need to pick one territory over another because of some sort of regulation or law in terms of where the data needs to reside. Um, so we've had, you know, partners in the U.S. that have said legally, you know, we need our stuff to be in this location, and we've, we've managed to do that with them. Um, you know, I think legally... I'm not sure you know, what the actual letter of the law is, but I think it would be you know, suicidal for Amazon to, to try and poach or cannibalize anyone's business because you know, they're doing so well with actually just providing that service, which you just couldn't get uh, a few years ago. So I guess I'm saying I don't quite know the legalities of that, uh, but there are usually ways of working <coughs> around it. I think, you know, again, I'm going to give you the digital answer. I think you've got to use some of the other great kind of internet-based uh, tools out there, like social media, because uh, that way you can have a dialogue with your customers. Um, one of the things we do is we've got a live chat service within our website and within our application. So if somebody does want to speak to a human being and ask about pricing or ask about how a feature works, then we try and have support guys online 24-7 to answer the question. Uh, you know, and those are key sales drivers as well, because sometimes somebody will just switch off and go somewhere else if they can't have that personal touch. But I, th I would say it's probably the 20% versus the 80%, uh, but it's still kind of significant enough to, to take some action, I guess. 
I think it's difficult. I think you know, the argument you've got to give is that if somebody is providing a cloud-based email service, then they're <laughs> going to know more about email than, than the company you know, in the valleys that are running email for 12 people. These guys are experts. This is what they do for a living, and they've got a team of engineers and experts on hand. And also, if there were any security risks, they probably wouldn't still be around because that would have been you know, bad press and they would have been long gone. Um, but it is a difficult argument, I think, because the cloud is this kind of mystical thing that you, you, everything's on the internet and everything's connected. There is that kind of uh, lack of faith in it. Uh, what, what goes wrong if you lose your data and what would you do? Um, but I guess you know, some of the things I was highlighting about how Basekit works and how we've got such a level of redundancy that even if there's a natural disaster, you wouldn't lose anything. You know, that's the kind of level of service you'll get from any cloud service provider. So you know, if, you, if that office had burned down one day, all your emails and everything would have gone. But actually, in the cloud, uh, by definition, you get more reliability and, and you know, even more security in a way. Well, we use pretty much exclusively software as a service. So we use Google Apps for all our email, which is in the cloud anyway. So we've got nothing to really back up. Um, so I guess the answer is no, uh, only because the, we use the cloud anyway, so it's already, it's already there. Um, and I think it kind of this, I'd give the same uh, statement to you as I gave to, to the guy over here, in that you know, the cloud is always going to be the safer place for it to be. You know, if you put it on a digital drive, you can drop that, you can lose it. I, I don't know what, what my finance, uh, my CFO does with that. I'm not sure whether they, whether they use that. But um, in the past, we have used cloud-based uh, accounting software. So I, I had one on the slide uh, in the middle of the talk there. It's called Xero, which is you know, cloud-based uh, accounting software. Um, so that would be, be one thing that you could do. But you know, what you're doing right now sounds fine to me. I think you can trust a service like Dropbox. Um, they're going to be you know, they're going to have multiple copies of your data in their data centers so that there's never any way that you're going to lose that. So it's, it's always a difficult argument. Yeah. I think the security point as well is, um, uh, you know, people do tend to think just because something's in the cloud and something's online, it's going to be inherently more or inherently less secure. But like you just said, you know, cloud infrastructure works identically. You know, it's a virtual version of a physical server. So you know, it's all to do with the service that you're using rather than the fact it's in the cloud. You know, if you trusted Google with something else, or if you trusted Microsoft, for example, with an offline package, you should trust them online because you know their engineering's good. Um, so you're going to get to know who the good providers are and what the good packages are, uh, and I think you can make quite informed decisions on that basis. <coughs> I think, again, you know, these cloud infrastructure providers let you give you the choice. So if you know you know, you, you as a business person needs to look at the, the regulations that apply to, to the data that, that you need to, to store. And if there are regulations that state it needs to be in the UK, then a cloud service provider like Amazon uh, will let you choose to, to be in the UK or to be in certain areas. So, you know, you just need to find somebody that, that's going to accommodate those regulations.